This WSIC weather report brought to you by White House Gardens, the largest supplier in the southeast of outdoor furniture, fountains, and planters. Visit them in Cornelius off West Catawba Avenue and at whitehousegardens.com. Mostly cloudy with a high of 75 today, cloudy with a slight chance of rain tonight, the low around 60, partly sunny Tuesday, a chance of afternoon showers, the high 83. Mike Jackson, WSIC News. Hey, this is Representative Jeff McNeely. We hope you go out and visit the fine folks at GM Milling Company in downtown beautiful Lowray, North Carolina. That's 4000 Taylorsville Highway, 704-873-5758. Give them a call or go visit for all your livestock needs, as far as feed or seed or whatever. They'll be glad to help you out. They're really good folks. I've known them for a long, long time. Go visit GM Milling, 4000 Taylorsville Highway, Lowray, North Carolina. For 41 years, your Auto Plus Auto Parts store is Johnson's Parts and Supply. Johnson's Parts provides quality auto parts, helping you to get your work done quickly. Your Auto Plus Auto Parts store is located at 1112 Shelton Avenue in Statesville, open Monday through Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and on Saturdays from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., closed on Sunday. Johnson's Parts, your Auto Plus Auto Parts store, located at 1112 Shelton Avenue in Statesville. Any views expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of WSIC. All systems are a go. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your seats. Taking care of Iredell with North Carolina State Representative Jeff McNeely is about to begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, Iredell County. Hope everybody's doing well on this here Monday morning. Uh, it's a nice day outside. I think they're calling for some thunder showers later on. So get what you got to get done now, and we'll see what happens later on. Uh, Want to wish all the mothers happy Mother's Day from yesterday. Uh, you know, the, one of the greatest blessings in our lives is our mother who loves us unconditionally. Um, and, and leading into that, being Mother's Day weekend, we'll just jump right into the news. And hey, anybody wants to talk, call uh, and talk to us, uh, 704-873-1400. Love to hear from you. So give us a call. So uh, beloved Governor Roy Cooper uh, on Mother's Day weekend was going around uh, having rallies uh, to make sure that we kill babies, basically. And, and he's upset that the legislature, uh, the House and the Senate, voted to move our abortion uh, days or weeks down from 20 to 12. And so he decided he'd go around and have rallies all over the state. I know he had one down in Davison. I heard it was pretty big. From what the Charlotte Observer said, there were six people there. So I, I think, you know, that, that speaks volumes about... Uh, what people feel they feel like this is a good bill uh he also had a crowd in raleigh uh participate didn't see the size of it but i you know if it was huge i'm sure we had heard about it and we didn't there was also a pro-life rally in the same place and i was just hoping that when the lord sent down fire and brimstone on one of them he'd spare the other so and y'all figure out which one i'm talking about but anyway he did veto senate bill 20 uh, on Saturday, which was protect women and children health care. Uh, and it's kind of ironic if you really think about it, folks, in the veto that he did. Uh, many things in this bill the Democrats have wanted forever and ever. And one of the things that they've asked for, and so as Republicans in this situation too, was to help supplement the cost of abortion and or more money into the foster care system to pay people to look after these these children that, you know, are having tough times, often the victims of domestic violence. And so there was a lot of money put in for that. I think it was around $20 million. And so... He vetoed that. There was also a part in there that the NCAE Teachers uh, Association has been wanting, and a lot of the state employees too. And so we're we're going to up the uh, maternal and paternal. So that means mother and father 
uh, maternity leave was going to be paid for, and I think that was going to be up to, I think, 12 weeks on it. And they've been asking for that. And you know what? He vetoed that. And then we also extended Medicaid for the mother and the child up to two years. So we're giving this child every chance for good health care and this mother for every chance for good uh, post-prenatal care. And guess what? And they've been hollering for this and wanting this forever on Medicaid expansion. But, you know, he vetoed that. There's also a part in there about supplemental child care. We got a caller. Let me finish this little part. Supplemental child care. They've been wanting people to help supplement on the cost of child care. It's so expensive. But you know what? He vetoed that. And then there was also birth control access, which a lot of people say has been too hard to get. We're going to get it where it's an over-the-counter and where we're going to supplement the cost of that. And you know what he did? He vetoed that. So we're going to take a caller. Let's see who we got here, Mark. Hey, this is Representative Jeff McNeely. Who we got? Uh, My name's Walter. Hey, Walter, how are you? Okay, I got a quick question for you on the debt ceiling. Yeah. How, how would that affect Social Security and veteran benefits? You know, it's going to be pretty tricky. There could be a delay because of that, and, and it's because Joe Biden. And actually, I haven't got a chance to do it yet, but Patrick McHenry, our congressman, is going to be on with me the second half of the show. So please stay tuned, Walter, because uh, Biden's inability to even want to negotiate or talk about it could put those things in peril. It could delay payments, so uh, this is not good, but uh, he's bound to determine he wants what he wants, and he's not going to do a thing about it to stop it. So, you know, I I don't really call that good government. I call that dictatorship. What do you call it? Well, I think think the whole thing is silly. I mean, the bad thing about it is the American people are the ones that are paying the price for it. They are. They always are the ones that suffer. They're the ones that pay the bills, and they're the ones that suffer the consequences. That's sad. And I've been hearing people talking about, they say, uh, we don't get our Social Security. You think January 6th was bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Well, that's, <laughs> there you go. I get you. I get you. So yeah, okay. there, there, there may be walkers and wheelchairs, but they're coming. You ain't going to stop them. <laughs> well, look, you have a good day, and I'll listen to the second half of your show. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting, so please do. Good good to hear from you, Walter. Thank you for calling right. in. Hey, thank you. Hey, bye-bye. Yep. So, folks, uh, you know, getting back to the uh, the protection of the women and children and, and their health, the uh, SB20, what all it did, all those things, everything we put in there, $160 million worth of good things for that mother, for that child, vetoed, vetoed. And, like I said, doing all these rallies and all these things on Mother's Day. And you know what I always say? You know, the good thing about all of us that are here and can hear my voice or can vote, your mother was pro-choice. I mean, uh, excuse me, pro-life. Let me get it right. Your mother was pro-life, and that's why you have that ability. Because if it was all up to everybody, there might not be near as many of us here voting. Know that. Uh, Make sure I got my terms right here because pro-life is a lot more important. Well, in, in a way, though, because, uh, you know, the baby the baby should have a say, too, right? So the baby would always choose, but they don't want the baby to have a voice. They don't want the baby to have a life or a heartbeat or anything else. So, Well, you know, I, I had a guy that was giving me a hard time on uh, Facebook, and I basically asked him. I said, you know, we're giving you 12 weeks to kill a baby that's uh, mm, pretty sad. much uh, defenseless. How much time does it take to kill one? How much do you need? How much sad. do the liberals need to kill one? It's sad. It is sad. It is sad. So, like I said, uh, it's a good bill. It's a good bill. It's a common sense bill. And we can tell by the size of the rallies that North Carolinians, by and far, want this bill. And I think a lot of them want more. So, And one thing I will tell you, I, I, on the uh, pro-life side, uh, and the polls ran, only about 30% or a third of the pro-life people wanted a heartbeat bill. So I'm going to preach to this crowd a little bit, too. These are, I guess, my people, as you would say. I want you to think about that, folks, that only a third, not total, a third of the pro-life wanted a heartbeat bill. If we can't get all the pro-life people on board, I don't know how you do make it work. So think about that. If you say you're pro-life, but yet you don't want a heartbeat bill. That's one of the reasons we're at 12 weeks. Okay, moving forward, and I want you to pray for us, Lord. Please pray, pray for this country. 
Looks like we do have a caller. We'll see who we got. Hey, this is Representative Jeff McNeely. Who we got? Hey, Jeff, this is Chris. Appreciate you taking my call. Hey, Chris. Just had a question on that bill. You were talking about state employees and teachers wanting uh, maternity and what you call it, paternity? Uh, maternal I've and never, paternal. So that's mother and father. That's both. Well, I've never, I've never heard of such, and that is crazy. But here's my question. For all the state employees that had kids, did, are they going to get that 12 weeks given to them? Nope. It'll just be going forward, Chris. I, well, I, how's that, how is that right? Well, you know, it probably really isn't. But as the old saying, it not. starts somewhere. It starts somewhere. And a well, lot of industry, yeah, but, actually, a lot of industry out there, they do offer this. And we compete with the private sector for employees. So as far as the maternal and paternal side. Idea. Do what? It don't mean it's a good idea. Maybe don't not. Mean it's a good idea. Maybe not. But it's it's the competition we have. I, I, the funny thing is, the uh, the liberals have been hollering for this for years, wanting it. Now they don't and you want gave it. Gave it to them. Now they don't want it. Yeah, how, but, do you, how do you make them happy? But, I don't know how. Well, I don't want to make the liberals happy. I want to do the <laughs> right thing, and that's what I want y'all to do. That's what I want y'all to do. Not to make the liberals happy. I want you to do the right thing. I agree. And given men, and given men. Paternity leave is absolutely ridiculous. Well, they don't absolutely have to ridiculous. take it. So we hope that some of them have got work to do and they want to go ahead and take off a little bit of time but not much and come back. But we are making that offer. We are making that but offer. But you should think about you should think about the past employees that did not get that. So you didn't give them their twelve weeks. Well you are giving money out. I, I, I heard my money away. I heard my older sister say that about me as the baby in the family was my mom and dad became more successful as they got older that I got more than she did yeah. and it seems like that's just the way it is unfortunately maybe we should have reparations for all of us dads that never got that time off well now, I, you know we should be, have state paid I, 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 if we, we if we do that then ain't nothing go. gonna happen for the next 12 months in America <laughs> we're gonna shut down so <laughs> that's right. well as a man I would be embarrassed to take it so I wouldn't have took it but it's just not right. We should not. I understand what you're saying, but we want y'all to do the right thing. Well, not not what appeases the Democrats to try to get them to do. Because in the end, the Republicans, as they always do, are going to fold. So well, I hate it. I'm a conservative, but I've watched the Republican Party over and over and over. They're going to cave. And the Democrats are going to win. And, and I hate it, but I appreciate what you do. And you have a good day. All right. I always know that co sometimes compromise is the word we end up with. Not always what you want, but it's compromise. So let me go to another. Let's see who we got. Hey, this is Representative <laughs> Jeff McNeil. Who we got? Hey, this is William. How are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? All right. This whole thing with the abortion, there's just no easy decision to make. Um, but you got to have pro choice before you can have pro-life now i understand that certain circumstances with rape that can't be helped but you gotta have pro-choice before pro-life you understand what i'm saying not exactly you're gonna have to explain so go ahead pro-choice pro-choice is is the man's got to keep his zipper up well he's got the woman's got to keep her legs closed you're talking That's about responsibility you're talking about responsibility exactly okay. exactly you got to have that first before you can have pro-life and i think some of these democrats and republicans are losing sight of that well, and, you know, that's one of the things. We we made birth control access, we subsidized it, and made it a whole lot accessible because that's what we really want. We don't want to argue over whether there's life at 12 weeks or six weeks. Or whatever. We want to make sure. Here's the sad part. 50% of the babies that are born in North Carolina are born on Medicaid. To me, that right. tells me that we did not plan this child, possibly. It happened. Now, that's 50%. Right. Because to me, when you're going to have a child, you start planning ahead and you save money, you make sure you have insurance that covers the bills, you do the things that are responsible to pay your debt for whatever decision you make. So, But 50% evidently aren't planning ahead or never thought about it till it happened. That's why we have 50% of them born into Medicaid. 
And that's the reason why we've got to make the decisions that we're making, the exactly. hard, tough decisions to make because they didn't make them. So I understand what you're saying, Jeff. I just wanted to throw that comment out there, yeah. and I appreciate what you are doing and, and Vicky Sawyer, you know, because it starts local. That's where it starts. Yep. And then, you know, just got to do what we got to do. But it's just no, there's just no um, easy way with this. It never has been and probably never will be. No. But we just got to try to stay ahead and stay positive and, and um, understand that Jesus Christ is first. Amen. And that, you know, that's all we can do. Amen. Take uh, care, Jeff. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, moving on a little bit to some other news, uh, uh, State Representative Jeffrey Elmore has entered the lieutenant governor's race. And the reason I bring this up, there will be quite a few entered on both the Democrat and on the Republican side since Mark Robinson is going to run for governor or is running for governor. Uh, Jeffrey Elmore's from up in Wilkes County. I've known Jeffrey for a while now. I actually, my nickname for him is Elmo off of his last name, Elmore. So Elmo's a good guy, smart guy. He's actually one of our few... Uh, he's a school teacher in the Wilkes County system, and he's also a legislator, which means his days are stretched and his time is hard to achieve. But Jeff gives us great insight. He has done a lot of the heavy lifting in our K-12 uh, committee and the House, and he's helped us on the budget. He's one of the uh, senior, uh, well, not senior, but head appropriation chairs. Smart guy, understands the education fundamentals, uh, would do a great job as lieutenant governor. Hope to have him on the show here for long. He done a lot of hard work in trying to get money up there for the new uh, to get the racetrack put back together. And so there's going to be a race this coming weekend. And uh, I'm sure Jeff's going to be proud of how it's going to turn out. Uh, it's the all-star race on uh, the old Wilkesboro track that really hadn't had much done on it and since the mid-'90s. First place I ever saw a race at 14 years old, Wilkesboro Motor Speedway. So, but uh, we'll hope to get Jeff on the show, and here's why he's here and why he wants to run for lieutenant governor. Uh, one other I'd like to bring in here is Josh Stein, and I'm going to probably talk about Josh every show I got from now till the governor's election because I feel like people need to know the quality of person that Josh Stein is, which is low extremely low quality it's funny now that our and he's our attorney general which means he's over our north carolina department of justice and after being there almost seven years he's finally come out with a safety public safety package now i would have thought being attorney general and that being your job you would have come out this a long time ago but he's only come out with it since he said he's running for governor on the democratic ticket uh, it's kind of funny. I guess he's finally decided he'll do his job once elected governor that he should have been doing as AG. And some of the things he listed, almost comical, uh, keep people safe. Hey, Josh, you hadn't been doing that, and you're the attorney general. So tell me what. I mean, you chose not to defend North Carolina's Constitution time and time and time again. Almost when you did do it, you did such a sorry job, we had to remove you from being our attorneys and hire our own. So I feel real secure knowing you're going to protect us, keep us safe. The next is protecting kids. Uh, and he talks about that, but then he's all for gender uh, reassignment for under 18 years of age. He's, way, he's right there for the transgens, wanting you to do that. Take your minor and get them mutilated and do whatever. And then he's also said he's for testing the sexual test kits. Well, guess what? We have one of the largest backlogs of test kits in the nation. And you know who's responsible for testing them, Mark? Josh Stein, our attorney general. But he's brought that out as one of the things he's going to fix as governor. He could fix it now. He's too sorry. So, uh, you know, he was improved public safety. He was one of the ones that want to defund the police, fight fraud. His office runs commercials. Go after the perpetrators. Let's go ahead and take a call because I'm getting fired up. <laughs> hey, this is Representative Jeff McNeely. Who we got? Hey, Jeff. Hey, Joyce. 
You know what? I had been able, you know, I've been trying to call his number, Jeff. I, and it won't even ring. The heck? Well, we're busy. Maybe that's it. We got people calling in left and right. You know, this is the most po- a top rated political small market talk show in the Southeast. So I pushed star 82 and dialed the number. It didn't go through. Then I tried again. And I, I left in the past, you know. Mm hmm. And he needs to know about this number. I cannot get through sometimes. It's it's not busy or nothing. But I want what I want to say is, Jeff, our world is not the same anymore. Mm. They're taking these immigrants and putting them in motels, and I don't know what they're going to do with them. All Jeff, do you know? I all I know is we're going to pay tax dollars out of our pockets to help make sure that they get a good quality of life here in America. It looks like are they going to be uh, able to uh, vote? I, you know, that's a good question, Joyce. I hope not. That's a well, good question. I, I don't think they should. Well, they shouldn't. If they're not American citizens, they shouldn't. I know. I think that's why Joe Biden uh, let them come in so that they can vote for him. Well, I, that, that's a good that's a good theory. A lot of us have that same theory. But you know, you're a very good guy, Jeff. Very good. You pray like I do, and I've been praying and praying. Keep doing it, baby. Keep doing it. And I want Donald back in there. Well, I, I I want somebody. I don't want Joe Biden. But I hope if, if it was Donald Trump, that, that would be that, fine. Right. If it was if it was DeSantis, that'd be fine. But we just can't take no more of what we got. You got that right, Jeff. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'll let you go, honey. All right, you take care, sugar. See you. Yep. Bye bye. All right. So anyway, so. All these great things I was talking about that Josh Stein has decided he that needs to be done when he's governor, he could have done when he was attorney general, which he is now. But, you know, it's not that important right now. But it's going to be real important when he gets to be governor. Give me a break, people. <laughs> also, want to bring forward this in the last few seconds. We don't realize how we get attacked left and right from our freedoms. But right now, uh, Joe Biden, his energy department has come up with this great idea to go after your dishwasher. Used to dishwashers use somewhere between 8 and 10 gallons. Under Obama, they moved it down to 5. Now Joe's going to have his energy department move down the mandates to 3.2 gallons per wash cycle. That sounds wonderful. The only problem with it is we don't have the technology to do it. And what ends up happening is, and I've seen this with my own dishwasher that we've owned now about three years, and the one we had before that we owned probably close to 20 years, and it was still actually working. Unfortunately, it was white, and we had to go with stainless steel because that's what everybody does now. That was a good dishwasher. The one we got now smells, and we have to wash them twice sometimes because we ain't getting the system flushed out. But anyway, so they're going to mandate this so that you can eat off of dirty dishes. And the hilarious thing is it talks about basically uh, the press release on dishwasher standards makes clear the intent is to reduce carbon pollution, combat the climate crisis, never mind that the trivial O2 emission savings from our ill-functioning whirlpool are laughable next to the coal plants in China being built. At least progressives are being honest about their goal in controlling every detail of American life. And yes, your gas stove is next. So... If you like the Nazis that we have in charge now, then keep voting like you're voting. If you don't, if you want liberty, justice, vote red. And let's quit being monopolized, played, basically just having every piece of our life controlled. Crazy. And save your old dishwasher no matter what it takes. All right, folks, Patrick McHenry's coming on, our congressman. Getting ready to take our break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. 
be with us. The latest headlines in weather now on News Talk WSIC 105.9 FM, 100.7 FM, and 1400 AM. Mike Jackson News. I'm Mike Jackson, WSIC News. The county sheriff's office says that Friday's threats of violence made against 3rd Street Middle School appear to have originated from somewhere outside the state. A statement from the sheriff said that the school resource officers were notified late Friday morning about threats posted to social media. The posts were being shared by students, prompting an investigation. And Democrat Governor Roy Cooper vetoed the Care for Women, Children and Families Act over Mother's Day weekend in an attempt to allow late-term abortions to continue in North Carolina. The General Assembly expected to hold votes to override Cooper's veto of the 12-week protection supported by 62 percent of North Carolinians in the coming days. The governor sanctions killing babies at the moment they feel pain. Now sports with Joe Burke. NASCAR over the weekend was at Darlington for throwback weekend. William Byron grabbed the checkered flag. Charlotte FC beat Atlanta United Saturday 3-1. And Jason Day wins the PGA Tour at TPC Craig Ranch. WSIC weather mostly cloudy through tonight, a high today 75. Chance of rain tonight, the low 60. Mike Jackson, WSIC News. Back here for the second half of the show. Let me see. I think my guy, my guest, has called in. Congressman McHenry, are you there? Hey, I'm here, living the dream, aren't you? All right. Yes, I am. If it wasn't for Roy Cooper, it would be a sweet one instead of a nightmare, but we'll work through that now that we got enough numbers. So how's things going in Washington? Uh, well, it's just, just boring up there, isn't it? Not much happening. Uh, ha, ha. We're just fighting the good fight. That's all we can do. Well, and, and and I tell you what, I do this every time. Folks, if you don't know who your congressman is, because Patrick McHenry is our congressman for our district, District 10, uh, I hate that because you should. He's been with us for a long time. Uh, we have had a couple of others, but Patrick's been our mainstay. He's done an excellent job for us. We are blessed. Patrick, tell us just a quick bit about yourself so people can know, for those who don't, that need to. I uh, Grew up in Gastonia, small, son of a small business owner, and um, you know spent spent my time uh, working in the last couple of years here in Congress for small businesses and folks in Western North Carolina trying to get a little lending, trying to get a little support, and um, that's what I that's my main policy work is helping small businesses and families access credit and investment capital. That's what I spend most of my time on, uh, and then from time to time, other things that we have to work on. Are, are pretty big, um, but beating back, everybody wants to politicize uh, how banks lend money, and um, and you know, and, and this big move by this administration on spending more money to to further fan the flames of inflation. Well, uh, real quick, we'll we'll just start. There's, I want you to rebuff or or, or or rebut some of the conspiracy theories going on, but we'll get in. But the big thing. And I know you're probably deep involved in it because you're chairman of banking. Is it banking and finance? What is the name of that committee exactly? Financial services. Financial services. I always, I always just call it the banking finance piece, but financial services, which covers a lot. It's broad and long. It covers more than people think. And it's a very important committee. And and uh, the, the good news is, since we have control of the House, uh, your co-chair or the other chair of it, I guess sub-chair now, she's no longer got the gavel. Uh, and, and thank God for that. You there, Patrick? Oh, yeah, okay. I thought I lost you for a minute. Yeah, we did. We did. We did. Scare me there. I was talking about your your Democratic, the, the past chair. Thank God she's no longer in charge. Well, look, I mean, I got I work with people in Congress um, all the time that, that have different points of view, and we try to get things done. And that's my obligation is to work with people and uh, get the best best uh, work we can get, uh, get best result we can get um, 
uh, into law. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. And the key things here are making sure that families have uh, economic choices they get to make for themselves, that people can access an affordable mortgage or uh, affordable lending uh, to send their kids to college, um, and they get to make decisions for themselves rather than having been done by bureaucrats in Washington making those decisions. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what I'm focused on, is making sure can, people can make those decisions for themselves. And we got consumer protection and uh, and, uh, and innovation that can still uh, work side by side together. Yeah. All right. Where are we at on the debt ceiling? What's happening with it? Because I think everybody wants to know. Biden wouldn't come to the table, wouldn't come to the table, and then he remembered, oh, yeah, I- I'm supposed to negotiate. I, I forgot. So where are we at with that? Well, look, every every debt ceiling is a moment where you take stock of the fiscal picture. It forces a conversation about our long-term spending and income as a federal government. Um, and the president uh, you know, and the speaker met. Um, uh, they met um, February 1st. And uh, the speaker said, Speaker McCarthy said, let's just sit down, let's work it out. Um, and um, and here we are, uh, over a hundred days later, and the president had their second meeting, uh, and the speaker said, "Let's just sit down, let's work it out. We have to take stock of our long-term spending in Washington. Where the federal government is forty percent larger today than it was pre-COVID, forty mm. percent wow. larger. Wow. We have record deficits. We have record debt. Deficits are what we run year over year." And debt is what we accrue on unspe- uh, un, uh, unpaid, uh, you know, uh, uh, bills. Please. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we leave America in, a, in better hands uh, than we found it, and we're leaving the next generation further in debt. So this is unacceptable. So we have to make sure that we take stock of our fiscal house when we have a debt ceiling, which is basically uh, a question of the cap on our ability to I uh, get lending um, uh, for our, our long-term debt to the country. So that's all we need to do is to make sure that we uh, we actually have some savings that we can we can bring. Uh, we know it's divided government. But Democrats can control the Senate and the White House, uh, but Republicans in the House are saying we need to ha- actually cut spending. I don't know that we'll get them there, but we can at least hold the line here. Um, in, uh, in this divided government, rather than continue the, the spending increases that this administration and Democrats in the House and Senate, let, you know, over the previous two years, put in place. Well, I, I know in y'all's uh, your bill you passed. What was it? Save. I can't remember the three different acronyms. Not acronyms, but you you had it save, in, limit, grow. Yeah, save, limit, grow. Y'all, y'all were basically asking to cap the spending. But also, in this, in the next 10 years, uh, with these things, we were going to save $4 trillion out of $60 trillion worth of spending. And the president and even some of the other senators I know and a couple of congressmen basically said, you're crazy. You're nuts for asking for these things. I mean, really, to me, I look at it and I'm like, it's not even 10%. It's like... Seven percent, maybe something like that. Well, I, how's that crazy? But in their eyes, I, I, I guess it is because all they know to do is write checks, spend, spend, spend. Well, yeah, and look, that they, they, they have the reins of uh, of the federal government, the House, the Senate, the White House, and they put in place three point six trillion dollars um, in new spending, uh, which is what lit the fuse on inflation. And when you go to the supermarket where you buy anything right now. Uh, you see that the costs are up from last year and the previous year and the previous year. Uh, this is a direct result of way too much spending yeah. in Washington. And it's important that we, we pair spending uh, so we can actually get back to stable prices again. Well, I, you know, the, I told him you can't have the Fed just raise interest rates. It doesn't work that way. 
you, you've got to cut spending when you raise the interest rates to actually make a dent in inflation. You can't just keep spending and think raising inflation interest rates to an astronomical level is going to really make a change other than put a, a, a crippling effect on our whole economy. So then you go from an inflation to a recession, maybe even a depression. So I, I've said this many times about the administration that's in there. Not only can they not run a country, but they couldn't run a country store. So sadly, Sadly. Sadly. Uh, Sadly. Well, let's talk about one other thing, and I think it's almost comical. I hear today that they say the the border's actually easing. We're down from about ten or 12,000 a day to like 4,500, so we're doing better. You know, we still have about 4,500 people cross, and I'm just sitting there going, Lord, help us. So I, they've tried to inst- put in some things. Let's do some stuff. What are we seeing on the border other than total chaos and mayhem? Well, look, last week there are estimated 10,000 illegal immigrants that, that poured in the, this country daily. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. you know, the the, the press in, in D.C. is saying this is not something abnormal. It's These are record crossings. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, frankly, if this is how many we're, we're stopping... How many are getting through oh, yeah. undetected? Yeah. Um, and where and, are they and what are we doing with them? Yeah. And we have no transparency on what they're doing with these folks that once they come into the country. So we don't know where they're taking them, where they're detaining them. Um, we know that many have been sent to, you know, across the country, including in North Carolina. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, this has made every state a border state and put additional pressure on law enforcement. You talk to, you know, you talk to, uh, any sheriff, um, you know, talk to Darren Campbell. He'll tell you yep. that, you know, I-77 uh, and I-40, I-77 uh, and I-40 are, are like, uh, you know, you know, straight conduits uh, from, from the border. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we, um, uh, we secure the border. That's why we passed uh, H.R. 2, which is the Secure the Border Act, uh, last week out of the House. And that's trying to continue uh, what uh, what President Trump did, which was start the wall, and we've got to finish it. Um, and we that's just one of the ingredients for uh, building stability at the southern border so we uh, we can remain a, uh, a free country. And uh, without controlling our borders, uh, it's it's really an open question whether or not you, you are a standalone country. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, what what are, what defines a country other than its borders? I mean, if not, you're a landmass. So uh, it's kind of crazy. But yeah, that, I mean, they've come to reasoning now that 4,500 crossing is it's okay now. We've got it under control. It shouldn't be, but 45 people, let alone 4,500 people crossing, down from tens of thousands a day. Uh, you know. I, Here's the thing that I've noticed, Patrick, that that bothers me and tells me something, too. Running a small business, uh, agricultural flavored, used to before Trump and the Obama administration when it was here, we'd get one, two, three a week of, of, we knew, uh, Hispanic or or some uh, somebody coming by looking for work, wanting a job. You know, and we'd usually say, well, you know, we'd, we're not hiring right now because you, you, you didn't want to go through the hassle of trying to prove if they were here legally or illegally and e-verify, and, and we just didn't need that. But since the Trump administration took over, that dried up. And I thought, well, okay, they're not crossing the border. That's why it dried up. We've got that under control. And for the much part, we did with the Trump administration. They did a great job. Then comes the Biden administration, and they've been pouring across. But guess what? I still don't have anybody coming by looking for work. What does that tell me? That tells me that they're obviously not needing work to survive. And if you're not needing work to survive with a record number coming over, then that tells me we're giving them everything they need. Well, look, I, I you know, I, I understand the motivation for people coming into this country. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, are, we are the, you know, we're the foundation of freedom internationally. Uh, you know, this is, this is where people want to uh, live their lives. We also know that there are criminal networks 
that want to take advantage of an unstable southern border. And, um, you know, this tells me uh, that we have a lot of work to do um, in, in it's going to impact the ability for us to keep uh, stable, you know, law-abiding communities across the country if we don't handle this uh, correctly. Um, and so we've, we've got our work cut out for us, and we need to make sure we enforce the law. Well, I, and I love they've sent troops down there to backfill on the border security to help border control agents and whatnot. And I'm just thinking, you know, if if we had a wall, if we had a way to keep them from coming in, we wouldn't be using all these resources and spending all this money. And the funny thing is the Biden administration just in the last week has said, you know, this is not legal that people are coming into our country this way. And that was actually a statement made. And that's the first time I've heard that come out of any of them's mouth, that to realize that they're entering illegally. I, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, well, one thing I know that you have been working on is this federal housing finance agency piece. Uh, maybe explain a little to people about what's going on because it's difficult right now to get a loan uh, because of the higher interest rates, and there's more to it than that. So maybe elaborate a little bit on what you've been working on with this agency that falls underneath your financial services chairmanship. So most of the mortgages in America go through uh, something called government-sponsored enterprises. Um, and these are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and you, you wouldn't know this as most folks wouldn't wouldn't see this as a consumer, but they're the ones that that buy the mortgage a, after they're originated. Um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency is the overseer, the regulator of those government-sponsored enterprises. They regulate what the mortgages look like. This agency that's supposed to be a regulator, it made changes to the pricing of loans hmm. that amounts to a tax on creditworthy buyers to subsidize riskier loans. So can you imagine that they looked at the cost of loans in America, and they, they instead of using existing rules, they changed it so that folks that are more creditworthy pay a higher rate, um, and then they lower the rate on less creditworthy people. So, so let me say, so the, the people with good credit that have tried their best to pay their bills and do what they should are being penalized and forced to subsidize people that have made poorer cho choices and have not done the things they knew to protect their credit score. So basically... What does that sound so, like? Sounds a lot like socialism, doesn't there it? There you go. You're taking money from one and giving to another because uh, they haven't done what they should. They haven't done their responsibilities. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I'll so we're pushing back on, on this administration that's trying to do this. And they're trying to do this in small ways and big ways. And when you touch the mortgage market, it's a big way. And it affects, it, it affects tens of millions of Americans. And what they want to do is subsidize riskier borrowers uh, and have uh, better creditworthy people subsidize those that are less creditworthy. This is exactly what caused the last financial crisis. And they're trying to recreate those policies. Uh, it's an absolute disaster, um, and it's a wrong approach. But this is the type of, um, of you know, of liberal policies this administration is trying to put in place to drive up the cost of of living for those that have, have tried very hard to make wise decisions with our money. Well, and you know, here's the thing too: because they're doing that, it's making housing and i know everybody says oh we need more affordable housing and 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 that's that may be very well true but all these policies actually create the exact opposite than affordable housing they they create unaffordable housing because even the people with good credit struggle to be able to get these loans and make these payments because of the socialistic atmosphere that's being created by this agency that nobody that nobody's really able i mean theoretically i know you fought they fall underneath you so they have uh people i guess we'll say watching them just like we do uh in our committees here so you're watching this but this is bureau bureaucracy at its finest because they're creating policies 
and they're not coming from Congress uh, to tell them to do these things. They're they're doing their own thing interagency. And that's the unaccountable nature of this administration. Well, it, you know, it's kind of like I talked about right before you came on, the dishwashers. You got the Department of Energy playing in our consumer appliances. First it was the gas stoves, and they're still not done with that. They got such a pushback, they slowed up a little bit. But they're going after that. Now they're going after the dishwashers and cutting the amount of water that they can use down. They're not going to be able to, We don't have the technology. It's kind of the same thing with the electric vehicles. We don't have the technology yet to be able to actually build the infrastructure to supply the idea that the crazy nuts have come up with with all the electric vehicles. We don't have the charging ability. I, you're going to wash your dishes twice to get them clean. You didn't save a daggum bit of water. It, it's crazy. Well, look, they have these outsized ambitions uh, that they can regulate their way into a new world. Yeah. And that's not how the marketplace works. It responds to incentives, not more regulatory hurdles, and they're putting in more regulatory hurdles. All right, well, we're getting down to our last about five or six minutes of the show, so let's let's just go out here and debunk some conspiracy theories. One of the big things I'm hearing is is that there's a vote coming, and the World Health Organization is going to be able to tell American citizens what they can and can't do with their health care. It's basically going to be the one that mandates how we go about all the future uh, pandemics, epidemics, whatever. Is there any truth to that? I see no bill other than that House Bill 49 that was going to make sure they didn't do something. No, with Republicans in, in control of the House, that will not happen. You said a key term there, with y'all in control. If y'all lose control, is there a chance they could let that happen? Would oh the my Democrats gosh. be that I mean, crazy? Oh, of course. That's scary, folks, knowing that we have somebody else trying to govern us from outside the borders of the United States of America. That's 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 world power, and they're giving it away. All right, let's uh, real quick, and I know it gets complicated, but the big thing everybody I keeps telling me is, oh, they're getting ready to pass something where we're going to do away with all the cash, and we're going to an all digital currency or or, or cryptocurrency. There's nothing out there happening. On that is, I know the Democrats talked about that central bank digital currency stuff, but that's kind of on hold right now, isn't it? Yes. Look, the Federal Reserve doesn't have law on their side to permit um, a to create a central bank digital currency. What we need is uh, we need law to ensure that uh, the private marketplace can create things called stable coins. Right, which is basically electronic payment. Uh, think of um, uh, private payments like using a MasterCard, Visa, a- American Express, or Venmo, or something like that, mm-hmm. um, or buy now, pay later. Those things uh, that we know how to use, um, this would create another way for us to move money. And um, I want to make sure that that is legal, um, and I want to make sure the marketplace can move forward uh, with uh, digital currency, digital payments, um, and more competition here, uh, so that we don't have a central bank digital currency. Well, that's just it, because that's the you know the central bank thing. I, it, it, hey, if people want to use digital currency, that's America. More power to you. But you know, I, 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 we don't want it forced upon all, and that's the big fear I think a lot of them see with the Biden administration, especially when they come up with that six hundred dollar transaction deal. That if you do anything over six hundred dollars, you know, you've got to that's going to be monitored and reported. Well, I got a hot summer month; uh, my power bill may hit more than that, so I guess I'd have to tell them how I'm cooling my house. But that's one of the big things. All right, we're, like I said, we're getting down here. We got a couple, just a couple more minutes, real quick. TikTok. What are we going to do there? Are we, I hear, I hear talks of banning it. I know we're removing it from a lot of different areas. What's your feelings on TikTok and our beloved it's Chinese? Digital fentanyl. It well, is when the Chinese <laughs> are on the on the back end. The communist Chinese are on the back end with these algorithms. Um, I, I think we got to take action here, and the president needs to take action. 
he has the law on his side, and he can take action without new law here. Um, and uh, that's what Senator Tim Scott and I sent a, just sent a letter to President Biden and said, you have the power, use the power, um, stop this stuff, and let's get on with this. Well, do you think he'll do it? I mean, I, unfortunately, Joe's pretty um, – uh, He's pretty tied in pretty tight with the Chinese uh, Nas- uh, Nationalist Communist Party. Um, I-, I-, I don't see him doing anything. What do you think the odds are that well, he's actually going to oh, do something? I think for us to create a law to ban an app is not the right approach. I don't think that's what we should be doing. I think we need to be smarter th- than that. And, um, we get, you know, so that's why I want us to use the existing law rather than create a new law um, that really means uh, – the federal government has new power over uh, over apps. I don't think that's the right approach. Well, I know, and just real quick, uh, well, I don't know if i got enough time to say it, I'm working on a couple bills where we're wanting them to work with like a third-party watchdog for these kids, and TikTok's basically told us, stick it, uh, in no short terms. And so I... We got to push back, though. Yeah. We got to push back. Gotta I mean, make sure that people have choices and and they they're free. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. But like I said, I do not trust him. Hey, we're getting down here near the end, and and we got to go, Patrick. I I, I got to get you back on. Maybe not next month or soon, but maybe the next. But we'll get you back on. Talk some more. Keep up the good fight. Do something to help us with this debt ceiling, please, please. We'll do our best. We're going to fight the fight. Thanks for what you're doing, Riley. Hey, man. All right, you take care. Thank we'll you, talk my soon. Take care. Bye bye. All right, folks. That's our Congressman Patrick McHenry. We'll get him back on the show. Uh, does great work for us. We're blessed. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our many blessings. Lord, we pray for wisdom always, discernment in these situations. Lord, I pray that we can uh, override the veto and save 30,000, 40,000 babies a year in North Carolina's lives. Just give us that ability, Lord. Let us be able to do it. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, folks, till next time, take care. For 41 years, your Auto Plus Auto Parts store is Johnson's Parts and Supply. Johnson's Parts provides quality auto parts, helping you to get your work done quickly. Your Auto Plus Auto Parts store is located at 1112 Shelton Avenue in Statesville, open Monday through Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and on Saturdays from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., closed on Sunday. Johnson's Parts, your Auto Plus Auto Parts store, located at 1112 Shelton Avenue in Statesville. Hey, this is Representative Jeff McNeely. We hope you go out and visit the fine folks at GM Milling Company in downtown beautiful Lowray, North Carolina. That's 4000 Taylorsville Highway, 704-873-5758. Give them a call or go visit for all your livestock needs, as far as feed or seed or whatever. They'll be glad to help you out. They're really good folks. I've known them for a long, long time. Go visit GM Milling, 4000 Taylorsville Highway, Lowray, North Carolina. Hi, this is Susan. I'm excited to let you know that Lake Mountain Coffee is now available for private events. A beautiful historic building with its 360-degree mezzanine has hosted many private parties, catered diners, and even an actual wedding. Please contact Andy at 704-252-1886 for more information. Thank you so much. Papa Tom here. What does it mean to be a dad? With tips from the Father's Heart Show, men can learn to become fathers again and in turn learn how to be an engaged, supportive, and loving father to their children. Join us for the Father's Heart Thursday mornings at 8 on News Talk WSIC. At the YMCA, finding your why starts by making an impact together, touching lives for the better. It can be the gift of time or treasure, supporting a community through talent without measure. Here, passion fuels commitment. Finding fulfillment through enrichment, serving, and improvement. What a way to live and what a gift it is to give. Find your why and get involved today at ymca.org for a better us. Get into Randy Marion Chevrolet in Statesville. 
Randy Marion Chevrolet in Statesville. We have got the all new Chevrolet tracks that is in stock, ready for you to test drive and take home. This thing is redesigned from top to bottom, back to front, all over. You would not believe this beauty. Come see it. Come take a test drive today. Randy Marion Chevrolet in Statesville, right off I-40. And look for the spinning car, folks, because that is where the deals are. King of Price, RandyMarionStatesville.com. If it touches your family, your schools, your city, or your safety, News Talk WSIC has it covered. Grub Ferry Road near the intersection at Hollywood Drive will be closed while... News Talk WSIC. News Talk WSIC, Statesville, Lake Norman, North Charlotte. Republican Texas Governor Greg Abbott continues his criticism of the Biden administration's handling of the border. Many of these migrants.